obviously have an incredible guest in James Stuart Cullen, who I just had the pleasure to meet earlier this week and um, really enjoyed our, our warm up conversation to this. So I thought it would be great a little bit to hear, uh, you know, James from you about, you know, your background uh, at Viacom CBS Paramount Plus and kind of what your remit is, just so everyone on the call knows kind of what you're doing, what your priorities are, and what you're working on day to day. Yeah, uh, of course. Um, so uh, I've been at Viacom CBS, um, which when I joined was was just CBS Interactive um, uh, for five years um, uh, this month. Um, was the first person hired in the um, original series group. Um, at the time, you know, CBS All Access was a nascent streaming service that was designed to, you know, support, I would say, you know, VOD um, viewership of the CBS catalog and you know the live streams of Big Brother and the the live stream of the CBS local feed, and I think you know they started um, to understand that the pickup and adoption of the service was strong, and so they wanted to attempt um, to put original programming on the service, and so I joined to help um, uh, lead that effort from a marketing perspective, um, and you know first program was uh, the Good Fight, uh, which was a um, a, uh, a spinoff of, of the Good Wife uh, series and then followed that quickly with uh, uh, the uh, um, successful Star Trek Discovery series, um, its first season in September of 2017. So um, I think, you know, there, um, we've, we've obviously scaled the platform, rebranded it since then. Um, and I think the, the amount of original content that we're putting on the service, you know, is immensely more than we've, we've had over the, you know, the, the course of in the life cycle of this uh, service. So it's been exciting to kind of be along that journey since the start. Yeah, you talked about that a little bit and I, I wanna impact some of what you just talked about, but I think one of the key points I had jotted down is that in like 2019, you had, you know, you had more originals in June of 2021 than you had in all of 2019. So talk about like, yeah. how much that has scaled from an original content standpoint. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the, the rapid kind of um, repositioning of a lot of these entertainment companies around um, focusing on, you know, the streaming service being the primary kind of revenue vehicle for a lot of the, the companies out there has, has allowed for um, a significant amount of content to be debuted on the streaming service initially. And I think um, because the models have proved out to be, um, you know, you know, extremely valuable um, for um, these 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 entertainment companies, and that's why we've seen a rapid scaling of original content. When you look at the market research and data and why people choose different streaming services, um, of course, um, exclusive programming is in the top list amongst I think things like value um, and depth of catalog. And so I think, um, you know, for us, the, the important thing is that Viacom CBS has a ton of IP to mine, given the historic uh, brands that exist underneath the Viacom CBS umbrella. And it's been fun to partner with a lot of the different, you know, iconic, um, you know, legacy brands like MTV, Paramount Pictures, Nickelodeon, and bring in some of that, I would say, nostalgic content um, that exists out there, things like iCarly. Um, and, you know, or some of the current stuff that still continues to deliver a market like a RuPaul or the challenge. Um, I think it's been a fun um, last few months as we kind of scale out the exclusive programming slate. I personally really enjoyed watching Younger. It's a great, great show, great program. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so, so talk about that a little bit, like in terms of like what it, what's, whether it's originals or all of the great content that you just mentioned, the different networks within the Viacom CBS family, um, is it originals that's driving net new customers or is it the originals that are keeping people like hooked into your network? You're obviously in like the white hot space of, you know, all of the major media outlets launching and promoting um, their OTT platforms and trying to drive consumers into a subscription product. like. How, did, how, how does that balance work in terms of bringing in you know, new subscribers and then trying to retain them when you can, you know, I was looking at your offerings just yesterday and you can sign up, but also cancel anytime. Right. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I think right now, I mean, our company is focused 
aggressively on acquisition I, just because I think there's so much opportunity and still a ton of consumers quite not yet served with the perfect kind of streaming bundle or package that they might desire. And I think we play a key role in that kind of perfect entertainment streaming package. I think that the, the things that are huge drivers for us are of course the big exclusive original content series. I think one of the unique things about our service in particular is that we have live sports programming on the service. Um, things like um, NFL on CBS during the fall. Uh, we recently beefed up um, our, our sports programming slate that's exclusive to us. Things like Champions League and a ton of different um, iconic you know, soccer leagues across the world, including Serie A. And so um, I think for us, it's a, it's a little bit more of a um, uh, um, having a different types of content slates that hit specific um, audience sets. And so whether you're a sports fanatic and um, you love reality TV, um, you have you know, an appetite for big dramas or sci-fi, you know, um, we of course also have uh, the full Star Trek catalog in our service and are releasing we have five current Star Trek series right now, which is crazy to say, um, and, and more on the horizon. Um, and we also have the Halo series uh, coming to our service. And I think that's going to be an exciting uh, endeavor for sci-fi fans. So really, the acquisition drivers are those big temple items. But the depth of the catalog, um, the niche programming that hits certain audience subsets within our user base, um, the um, nostalgic programming that we're bringing in, and then I, the fifth one that's consistently been a, a great retention vehicle for us are the film catalogs that we're adding to the service now. And we've beefed up that slate too. Um, and I think that allows for a nice kind of um, amount of content that people can engage with on a consistent basis within the service. You guys recently um, put out an offer, I think it was recently, to allow consumers a bundle of Paramount Plus and Showtime. Can you talk a little bit about that strategy and how that's working for you? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting partnership for us. You know, obviously Showtime being um, a part of the Viacom CBS family too, it just made natural sense for us to, to, to put a combined offer into the marketplace um, to help, I think, again, going back to kind of the main key points, to, to showcase value for the consumer. Um, I think it also allows for an ease of um, a, a kind of central destination um, for people to watch all of those kind of premium dramas that exist from Showtime. Um, and um, also all of the great programming and live sports programming that we have on our service. Um, so I think it was a value play. I mean, we're looking for, you know, to drive again acquisition to market. Um, that's a, you know, those are two iconic brands, Paramount and Showtime, and putting them together, I think, just made natural sense um, in order to kind of, uh, again, you know, increase that acquisition um, in the space. Got it. So five years is a long time in, in, our, in our world, in our lifetime, working in, in media and advertising um, and marketing, um, and so much has happened in that time in, in just the Viacom CBS realm and then even the greater landscape. But um, you know, during, during the COVID time that we've all been kind of suffering through, um, your area, you know, streaming and, and the cord cutting activity of, of you know, your traditional cable subscriber has just been accelerated um, due to a lot of factors, right? So I would imagine, you know, your approach to marketing your service, and you also went through, you know, massive rebranding during that, you know, last couple of years as well. But your your approach to marketing and reaching new consumers to come into you know your service has had to change just given the consum media consumption habits having rapidly changed. So talk a little bit about that process, how it's changed, how it changed during that period, and then what what has it done to change you know longer term how you think about reaching consumers. Yeah, I mean, I I think you know you know the. Um... You know, the merging of the company aside, I think COVID, of course, has impacted all of us in terms of how we market. Um, one of the first things that we ask our team to do um, as we look at kind of core strategies for any show that we release or any big marketing campaign, um, but specifically shows, is like, how do we make this show feel big? And I think that's like the first big question that we ask, you know, our, our marketing strategists on the team and our creative leads uh, to figure out. And I think, you know, during the COVID era, um, it's it's been more challenging because the traditional marketing levers that you pull to make you know series or campaigns feel big um, may have lost their amount of um, I would say exposure 
um, appetite. And so what I mean by that is, um, you know, generally you would pull the lever of big out of home activations and broader kind of out of home campaigns. Um, you know, you'd have those experiential touch points throughout the kind of um, the country um, that allow for fans to interact and engage, you know, in person and um, with an IP they may be excited about. Um, obviously, during COVID, both of those things, you know, especially in person activations went away and out of home, there's less people outside driving around, you know, or, you know, commuting and transit kind of media, you know, doesn't have the same amount of exposure um, as it traditionally did. And so I think what it, what it made us do is actually be really much better at how do we really understand what the audience is doing, reset that conversation, work with our, you know, uh, our BI team to kind of really understand what type of, um, where are people going and how do we be impactful in those spaces during a time that's really unprecedented for any of us um, that we were living through, um, let alone, you know, not being in the office and having kind of like those collaborative aha moments that often happen in person. Um, and so I think, you know, we had to reset that and, and again, think, be research focused, be data driven and understand what media spaces um, um, are going to be where we reach consumers. Um, and one example uh, that I'll bring from this, the Star Trek space um, is, you know, Star Trek tr traditionally has been um, a convention circuit um, and uh, in-person um, impacted kind of uh, IP. Um, the the Comic Cons, the Star Trek conventions of the world, are where you're able to reach fans directly and make lasting memories that keep them engaged with that property for a while. And so we had to ask ourselves, you know, how can we bring the convention um, uh, world to people in a COVID era? And so um, we we rallied around um, you know a historic moment for for Star Trek, which is you know we, we kind of reignited the Star Trek Day celebration. In 2020, we did a virtual um, capture of um, over uh, 60 different Star Trek talent um, from across the world and brought that kind of panel convention moment um, to the fans in 2020. Um, and it was, we also used that as a marketing vehicle and um, accelerator for the current programming, dropping trailers, promotional items, um, et cetera. Um, and we added a charitable component to it um, that I think was well received by the fandom and beyond. And so in 2020, we did that to much fan, you know, uh, fair and, and it was exciting. And so we challenged ourselves this year, can we do this in person, um, even uh, in kind of, you know, a, a tough COVID time. And we were able to work with our COVID task force and our events team to build out a, a kind of incremental Star Trek Day celebration that we did in person live at the Skirball Center um, and with a live orchestra and hundreds of attendees, you know, socially distanced um, in attendance. And um, again, using that kind of like experiential world and broadcasting it for free live across the globe um, is something that um, was a special moment to see, you know, LeVar Burton and Jerry Ryan and George Takei up there celebrating, you know, Star Trek legacy alongside all of our new Star Trek talent like Anson Mount, Sonequa, Martin Green, et cetera. And I think, you know, for us, those types of special things only happen because we were challenged to think harder um, in a time where, you know, it was hard to be a marketer. And I think, you know, we were excited to kind of put something on like that. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, first, the, the digital only um, initial Star Trek activation, and then, you know, the fact that you've been able to not only bring it back to being a live event with in-person attendees, but then you were also able to make it virtually accessible for those people that can't be there in person. And probably, do you think that going forward, that's how you approach all events or most events, um, given that, you know, that allows you to bring more people in that normally just wouldn't travel regardless of COVID restrictions or, you know, just maybe some companies that don't give some younger um, employees or some fans that don't have the budgets to attend in person would love to have virtual access to these types of events. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I think we have to. I mean, um, there is certainly a clamor for it. I think, you know, amalgamating the um, your promotional kind of items together creates kind of like this echo effect that allows for you know, incremental value of exposure to be um, added to your campaign um, delivery. And I think, 
you know, as we look at the future um, and, and think about, you know, what are some other ways that we could do something similar like Star Trek Day um, with our broader brand, I think, you know, we're starting to see other brands kind of, you know, do this as well. I think this past weekend, Netflix had its, you know, inaugural to doom event. Um, it looks, you know, later this, um, this quarter, you know, Disney's putting on their Disney Plus Day. You know, I think we're starting to see a lot of these streaming service brands wanting to make these eventized moments for these key properties that exist out there. And I think, you know, we'll, you know, we're in the same boat. It's, it's critical to kind of get your content in front of people and showcase the value and the exciting stories that we're telling. Um, and, you know, what a better way to do that than a kind of fit, a, a free celebration of it um, to fans who are looking for that anyways. Um, I think it's, it's certainly valuable and something, you know, all of us will probably look to do in the future. Yeah. And, and probably that experience just to keep improving upon it. I know on the B2B side, like we, we talked yesterday, we did our, our annual upfront uh, presentation last week in New York City. We had over 300 people in attendance. We did not make that virtually accessible um, just because we thought that it would be loud and difficult if you weren't in the room to stay engaged. What we did was just film it all, package it up into a, you know, a stream that includes all the highlight reels and then the, the speaking engagement aspect of it and share that out to the folks that weren't here. Um, but it is, it, is a, it is a challenge, right? Of like, how do you make an immersive experience in person really great while also making sure that you're mindful of the experience that person is having virtually, which you, know, you don't want them to feel, you want them to feel part of it. You don't want them to feel like, they're, they're on the outside looking in. Yeah, I mean, it's complex. It definitely is, you know. Um, you, you know, you put together these events and you are kind of thinking about both opportunities, like um, how do we make, you know, that experiential in-person um, moment feel just as strong as someone who is watching it on their TV screen? I think certainly there's always going to be a lean towards when you're there in person, there's something you know incrementally special about that than watching it taped or live. But I think there are still ways that you can use some of the interaction vehicles that exist out there nowadays um, in social media platforms to uh, you know, incrementalize the kind of um, interaction experience that you have with the digital stream of, of an event. So James, you talked a little bit yesterday about different ways of reaching consumers. And you touched on it earlier too, in terms of like, you know, the way you think about maybe out of home is different now. And as a, as a marketer, you're down to think through a, a different lens of, of where, what mediums and, and what forms of advertising um, might reach and impact a consumer. And you talked a little bit about interruptive advertising versus a more you know, relationship oriented style of advertising. Can you just talk, elaborate on that a little bit for everyone? Cause I think, you know, in the spirit of innovation I think that's probably what people are really interested to hear is like, what, what are you doing differently now? And, and what's working for you in terms of how you're, you know advertising your originals and, and overall your, your services to consumers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know there certainly is, um, you know a value to things like, um, you know, homepage takeovers in the digital space, um, mid-roll and, and pre-roll inventory, um, you know, in, I would say, you know, demo aligned programming. Um, you know, I think those traditional kind of in linear as well, you know, I think, I, I think those traditional types of, um, of ad products are, you know, have shown their value and certainly um, can uh, still deliver and will deliver over time um, uh, incremental value to kind of, you know, your, your media and marketing campaigns. You know, I think one of the things as a consumer myself, I think about is, you know, um, you know, sometimes, you know, those products, you know, especially in the digital space can sometimes feel interruptive to how, um, what you're trying to do in the moment. Um, through, you know, maybe there's a pop-up ad or a takeover and you're just trying to read a, you know, an article about something or what have you. And, and I think one of the things that we have started to talk through a bit more is how do we look at um, less increment, uh, interruptive advertising and more advertising that um, adds value to a consumer's, you know, experience, whether they're in social and whether they're in digital, um, et cetera. And I think, you know, I think some of the shift I've seen from some of our media partners is, that, is this idea of how do we do custom partnerships? How do we think through ideas 
um, that um, are you know value add in terms of how do we do a custom article? How do we kind of extend that kind of piece in that campaign to you know your likely broad reaching social channels? What are some things that we can partner on that can provide value to a consumer um, that is still advertising you know at its core, but at least is giving them a touch point or an experience with you um, that um, that is positive. Um, and so I think you know as we work with different folks like Barstool, for example, and we think about um, what are different campaigns we can launch together, um, I think we we are starting to shift and think about you know think of, make the hard kind of like decision about how do we you know of course you know have an allocation that has both of those types of products as a part of it, but also ensure that we're really strong in the added value advertising space. You know, I think this also takes effect in how we think about influencer marketing and how we approach influencers, you know, hearing their, time of, their tone of voice and their kind of brand, understanding what they value and what their audience values, and then partnering, truly partnering with them to kind of provide a, an ad product out in their space that is going to be received well and is going to have the same impact that a native post would that isn't paid. I think those are all the kind of the tough the tough things to do um, that may not be you know uh, run of the mill marketing, but that certainly I think pays off in terms of reach and extension of your campaigns. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense, and it's like harder to do, and it's more work, right? It's just yeah. like vetting those partners to find the authentic publisher or influencer that you know fits your tone the tone of a particular program or overall what you're looking to go for or whether it be you know really listening and or watching and getting to know their content to make sure you're going to be comfortable with it and how they do advertising or other uh, brands um, that they are you know promoting I know in our world you know our tone is really edgy mm -hmm. and, our, and we do do a lot of like direct integrations of you know uh, our partners right into the content in a way that I, I don't see in a lot of places, certainly not on the mainstream um, networks, but you have to be comfortable with it. You have to let us be us and let us be authentic and, and have that tone. And I know from, you know, sitting on the other side of the table, that is not always as easy as it sounds um, because there's certain, um, you know, key talking points and the do's and don'ts of every brand partner we work with. And, and that's across the board. Um, but in order to get that authentic integration, it requires a level of like kind of letting go a little bit with, within mm -hmm. reason, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you have to, and then you have to find the right, you know, alignment there. I mean, there's certain, there's probably programs that don't work for, you know, a bar store or any other kind of piece. And then there's some that are perfect for it. And it's knowing that having that kind of baseline depth, in-depth knowledge of both the program itself and the brand or person you're trying to partner with, that's where the real work has to be done. Absolutely. Absolutely. Have you guys done much in podcasts? I mean, one of the, um, one of the, the feedbacks I've had from the entertainment category in general is that, you know, you're very visual as, as marketers because you're trying to push out your own trailer and your own talent personalities within your programs and something that's very audio in nature doesn't necessarily always stand out. But yeah, I just arc of podcasts, which is why I asked the question. I'm sure others, yeah, it's such a fast growing space. Well, I mean, speaking of like authentic voice, like, I mean, that's one of the spaces that I think has seen the most um, growth in terms of not necessarily being interruptive advertising, but kind of a nice free flow from what they're talking about into host voice reads that, you know, if you, if you partner with the personality well, um, you're able to kind of make that feel uh, more integrated into the program itself. I think obviously they're, you know, we get the briefs and the talking points and sometimes we just kind of give them the script and like let it happen but i think you know the what we're seeing in our research is that one of the most sticky channels is podcasts and i think there's obviously been a growth in podcasts you know as that space has become a bit more um i would say popular uh, amongst consumers because a lot of big personalities have moved from or have created kind of spaces within you know that marketing channel um you know, we, we like that space um, because one of the natural um, things that you, consumer behaviors that happen within podcasts is very similar to how you choose a different show that you're going to watch, right? You're trying to find 
your next big podcast you want to read on your runs or during your exercise regimen or um, you know as you kind of you know commute into different places or maybe you're on a long vacation um, I think you know that consumer behavior finding trying to find that next bit grade kind of podcast that you're going to enjoy is similar to what we kind of do on um, you know the program marketing side and and you know even on the brand marketing side as well as we kind of try to provide you a, a new option to watch content. You know, I think that's the exciting piece here is that um, being able to kind of have those integrated moments within those different programs does allow for us to kind of expose people to different um, uh, VOD programs that they may not have been aware of. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, just on podcast specifically, one of the things we're seeing that I think is really exciting for podcasts, but kind of ironic in a way too, is the biggest growth we're seeing on our podcast networks is happening on YouTube. So it's now become a visual medium because we can not only um, speak uh, about our partners and their products and their services, but also integrate graphics and overlays and, and content to the degree that um, we have the IP cleared um, that allows for what has been to date a very audio focused medium to become now multimedia and also interactive in a way so see see more on that from Barstool but I think probably in general in the podcasting space is um, more more visual um, and, and um, video representation of again what a podcast used to be what it goes becomes in the future yeah, I mean, I think uh, just the last note on that is that, um, you know, even it, one of the things that we're, we think through too is how do we extend our IP into the podcast space? And, you know, I think we've certainly done that. A couple of Star Trek podcasts that we put out there, they be, they're really great marketing vehicles, you know, for, you know, different programs. We actually did a custom podcast with a, with a media partner um, a while back um, that allowed us to, ex, you know, extend um, our campaign and, and I think you know that um, that's an exciting space for us to kind of look into as well. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, talk about um, you talked about the Star Trek example as you know one of your projects you were more recently uh, was a big success and you're proud of talk about you know what's new what's next what's coming down the pike for Paramount Plus on the original side and, and what you can share with us in terms of where you're looking ahead to for both um you know new subscriber growth as well as just overall prioritization for the brand yeah i, I think um you know sci-fi like, there's a couple of lanes that i think we can win in i think you know number one um you know sci-fi certainly is one of those spaces uh you know i think there's competition in that space no doubt but with um with the kind of you know alignment of the catalog being on the service you know fully with the expansion of the universe, um, the Star Trek universe, um, to uh, you know both pre the original series and you know way out you know, to you know thousands of years in the future from the original series, there's a lot of storytelling to be done there, and, and you know we're excited to have you know, Alex Kurtzman and Secret Hideout, you know, along for that that journey to kind of really bring that that um, storytelling further. I think mean, we're excited about the Halo series coming to the the platform. And that's a huge, you know, IP, one of the, you know, <laughs> biggest selling revenue generator IP ever. Um, you know, Halo certainly is a story that we're, story of the land that we're excited to kind of visit. I think we, we do really well in live sports. I think it's a unique offering for us. You know, having, first of all, having a live stream as a part of your um, SVOD subscription service is unique. Um, we're one of the few streaming services that have that alongside the VOD offering. But to have kind of the level of sports content from, you know, the PGA tour to NFL on CBS to SEC on CBS to, um, to all of the great soccer programming from, you know, the biggest world event that the champions league um, to, you know, Syria and beyond. I mean, and I think, you know, we're really great in reality TV. You, you pair the, the, the world of MTV um, and CBS, you know, both known to bring really big reality TV shows from Big Brother to Survivor to RuPaul's Drag Race to, you know, uh, The Challenge and Beyond. Um, and we've even brought back the real world, the original reality TV show um, to, to, uh, to the service. That's it's just like for, if you're a reality TV junkie, it, we're the service for you. And then lastly, it's, it goes without saying, but having the Nickelodeon brand and all of the great kids content makes us a family brand. And I think, you know, having the, the ability to 
you know, as a, as a parent, you know, watch, you know, a, a huge blockbuster film, you know, maybe on Friday night, wake up and have your kids watch, you know, so much Paw Patrol on Saturday morning and beyond and watch it over and over and over again. Um, I think, you know, to us that that is, that helps with re retention for sure. And I think, you know, it's an exciting kind of world that we have this full 360 uh, content slate um, that allows for us to hit, you know, the, the full family um, uh, as a part of their, their viewing experience. Sorry, I had to mute myself there for a minute because there is actually, uh, and if you see the flashing, it's uh, there's like a fire, uh, what do you call it, drill going on in the building here. So I don't know if I'm the first presenter to ever have that happen in Brand Innovators, but it's kind of funny. There was a lot of commotion while you were talking, but I was trying really hard to focus in. Okay. Um, one of the questions that someone sent me um, privately while we're talking to you, James, is do you see collaboration between yourself, your brands at Viacom, CBS, and Barstool, um, which, you know, I didn't ask that question. That was a loaded question from the audience. But, um, you know, as you talk about uh, reality TV, I, I have some ideas for you because we did two pretty successful digital, uh, digitally distributed reality series last year. And we're, we just announced two more at our at our upfronts last week. So be on the lookout for that. And maybe, maybe you'll find them on Paramount Plus in the not so distant future. Um, I do want to talk though about Halo and also sports because I think those are two really, really interesting segments. And Halo, obviously, like, do you then look to in a way of promotion to like go into the gaming community as a way of promotion? Yeah, I mean, critical to that partnership, of course, is our is is our partnership with uh, 343 Studios and Microsoft Xbox. And I think um, you know, we we are working closely with them to ensure, you know, of course, our content calendars align, that we, we get downloads and insights and consultation consistently on how to best treat that series, how to talk to the consumer, what excites them, what doesn't excite them, um, what are the different ways that, um, uh, you know, uh, we can, um, you know, think through what they've traditionally done and leverage that historical knowledge and insight to propel this, this series forward. And how do we complement, as I think we all know, the current gaming release that's coming out, um, you know, the latest um, edition of Halo, Halo Infinite. Um, I think, you know, for us, you know, that space is similar to Star Trek, filled with avid fans that are very active in conversation about the brand, about the universe. And we plan to kind of, you know, excite them as much as we can with this new storytelling medium for Halo. Um, and I think it's going to, I think people are going to be excited what they see. I, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of the footage come in so far and it's beautiful and we're excited to kind of share that with the fan base. Um, you know, live sports, I think, uh, you know, CBS has always been synonymous with, you know, sports programming amongst other things. Um, and I think it's exciting for us to be able to partner with the CBS Sports Group um, to bring that experience into a, you know, to a digital era and ex expand that kind of content offering to have multiple types of uh, touch points for the consumer um, in terms of how they, how they watch it. You know, of course, the big temple programs like NFL Sundays, um, SEC Sundays are always great. Um, but I think, you know, the, the expansion into soccer, which is a growing, massively growing sport, um, especially domestically, the growth of, of soccer programming and um, uh, adoption um, has, been, has been really um, surprising to me as, a, as someone who played soccer and loved soccer growing up. It's been great to kind of see that blossom, I think, over the last five to 10 years within the U.S., um, and so that's important to kind of, you know, talk through, you know, and, and communicate that to consumers that, you know, live sports are a key part of our value proposition um, because it's a unique one. Um, and I think it's certainly something that we will continue to tout in the future. Yeah, I, I live in the world of sports here and I've, I always have. And I'm also as a consumer and a fan of, of many of the professional sports you guys carry and, and elsewhere. You know, I do think one of the things that's interesting right now, I mean, live sports has been held up for a long time as the thing that's keeping traditional TV, you know, rights alive and um, keeping cable TV you know, alive. And, um, you know, now you see Viacom and CBS, Disney and other major networks, uh, you know, really prioritizing and leaning into streaming in a way that has 
a lot of sports fans trying to figure out where they what which services they need to get to get the full package like do i need you know paramount and then one other you know another partner to just be able to get my full round suite of sports program i think there's a lot of confusion around that with sports fans um, we have a partnership with another ott platform that happens to have a lot of um, college uh, college sports uh, particularly football rights as well um, and they're leveraging our college football show to make that known. And the host of our show, who Brandon Walker, who is like a diehard college sports fan, didn't even know when we had brought, walked him through it that they had all the, the programming that they do have, all the games that they have. So I, I think that's something that is really fascinating as you know, live sports has always been kind of held back from um, these platforms, and now you're seeing it really proliferate there, I think will be an interesting transition over the coming years ahead. Yeah, I mean, I think it definitely will. And I think, you know, it's, it's a competitive space too. You know, it, it certainly, I think the different streaming services as they look at their content offering, I think you're starting to see others, you know, understand that importance and, and dip their toes into that space too. And I, I don't, I foresee that happening more and more, you know, in the future. Um, one of the other questions from the audience was, you know, what can heritage brands learn from newer digital first brands when it comes to authentically marketing to Gen Z? And you're not just marketing to Gen Z, you're marketing to a variety of different demographics and using different niche programming to, to attract them. But do you have any specific insights around, um, that Gen Z younger generation and, and how you're trying to reach them in ways that you didn't have to previously think about. Yeah, I, th I think you have to start with, you have the product that is going to work with the Gen Z audience. Like if you, you know, I think, I think you have to start with like really examining if the product that you're offering, whether, you know, it's a consumer product or, you know, for us, the product that we offer, of course, is the broader service, but mostly the content exists in it. So do we have a program that is going to have an attraction to a Gen Z audience? And we certainly have had that, you know, as we've expanded into some of the Viacom legacy IP who have traditionally done really well and with, you know, reaching younger audiences. And I think, you know, then what you have to do is understand where is Gen Z? Like what, how do they communicate? What is important to them? Um, I think saying just social is probably too, too much of an easy answer. Although that is, um, you know, uh, it's certainly a space that is critical, but I think what you have to do is really examine how they interact in the social space. And going back to what we were talking about earlier, being authentic means that you work in partnership with brands that are authentic in that space and take some of that equity that they have and use their voice to help promote your products. I think that also means that you, if, when you work with these different you know, influencers or, or brands that exist uh, that do that well, uh, you also have to ensure that you feel like um, they're going to be able to speak well of your product and that they understand it and that they actually are truly a kind of a fan of it. If they're not, then maybe that's not the right partnership and it's something you got to think through again. But it's really kind of finding that sweet spot of, you know, uh, what um, you know, someone who has an authentic voice or is an authentic brand partnering with them to demonstrate your authenticity and putting that, you know, packaged out into the world that shows kind of like that kind of synergy of brand love together. That's, I think that's what we've done well. And we've done that with some of, you know, our iCarly campaign that we put out there. That was certainly one that we, we worked with the TikTok community to have a really strong um, campaign that, you know, like exploded and had billions of impressions. And it was, it was so exciting for us to see. And, I think led to some of the success we saw with that show, you know, leading to its second season renewal. So I think, um, you know, those are, those are the types of things that we're thinking through, you know, that, you know, that we talk about in terms of authenticity and reaching a younger audience. I love it. You led me to my, what was going to be my final question because based yeah. on where we're going is, do you work with TikTok? Have you tested and, and had success on TikTok? And it sounds like for iCarly, you absolutely have. And it's our fastest growing platform. Um, and so we're pretty leaned in there as well. And I think uh, it's exciting and it's also just like a brave new world. So kudos to you for being in there and, and you know, figuring out how to unlock that, that audience and to, to really work for you. Yeah, exactly.
Awesome. Well, I see Brian is back, um, but uh, it was great talking with you, James. Really appreciate all your insights. Um, congrats on all the success and uh, look forward to, to seeing you again sometime real soon. Awesome. Thanks again, Deirdre. Exciting to be a part of this. Thanks all. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Back to you.